excuse me, I, I uh, have a, a little bit of a cold tonight. Um, actually, maybe could I get a little bit of pity from the audience? Maybe an R? Thank you. But you, you didn't really mean that, did you? And uh, that's, I want to talk a little bit about that. The, the difference between kind of what we show on the outside and how we're actually feeling on the inside. And in fact, how in many ways we live two lives, the life that we see on the outside and the life the way we're really feeling. And maybe how technology can help us to understand people's inner lives a little bit better. So to explain more of that idea, I'd like to use an example of someone whose inner life I'm very familiar with, which is myself. So th this is how maybe people on the outside saw my positivity um, from m of my adult life, from the age of 1988, um, from the uh, year 1988, when I was 18, and I started at college up to the present day. So I started at college, and everything seemed to be going pretty well. Uh, people thought I was a little bit nervous. And I toddled along, as far as they could tell. Everything seemed fine. And then they began to pick up there was something wrong with me, and it was... I was drinking too much, I, and it was more than that, in fact, I was developing a drink problem, and this got so bad that I had to leave university temporarily, and um, I, I went back to my hometown, and I stopped drinking, and this had a profound effect on my life, and everyone around me could see that, and I, I got into mindfulness and spirituality, and everything seemed to be on the up from then on. I, I, I got my degree, I got a PhD, I went to work on Wall Street, I joined a startup, and then it all peaked in 2006, 2007, when I had my most responsible and highest paying job. And then I decided to leave that and take a job for a quarter of the salary in academia. And of course, everyone thought, well, that's a bit of drop in, uh, in positivity there. And things have got a little bit better since then, as far as people are concerned. So there you go, that's my adult life. But of course it's not, it's, it's not what I felt over that period. If we look here at the thick line, that's how I was feeling. That's a much closer inner feeling world to what I was experiencing. And it, as soon as I got to college, my drinking became too much. I, I, I plummeted into the depths of misery really very, very fast. It was chronic alcoholism. And when I was at the the bottom of it in 1993, I felt worse than anyone could have imagined. But then when I sorted out my life and stopped drinking with the mindfulness and the spirituality, it had a profound effect on me. At times I felt ecstatic with happiness. And then a strange thing happened. Where everyone else thought my life was going better and better, I slowly got more and more obsessed with money and prestige and my inner contentment dropped until I decided to take that 75% drop in salary and came into academia and then things just took off and I, was, I, I got a creative job and I was, I was much happier and things have just got better since then. This is not so uncommon. I mean, I, not everybody drops into chronic alcoholism, obviously, but this split between the inside and the outside is not so uncommon. Who wants to admit when their, their, their life seems really successful that they're miserable? Who wants to tell their friends that the seemingly perfect relationship is actually a sham? We, we, we do hide these things from people. And, you know, maybe if you could follow someone 24 hours a day and look at their body language and the sort of things they were saying and their facial expressions, you could get a sense of what's going on inside, but of course we can't do that. Or maybe even famous people who are in the public eye frequently, many of them have PR agencies who, who try to avoid this, this emotional leakage for them deliberately. However, there is one type of uh, person, famous person, who almost prides themselves in showing their weaknesses and expressing themselves and the truth about their feelings. These are artists and musicians in the work that they do. In fact, some of the work of these artists is almost like a free association. They open up their unconscious and their feelings. And, and therapists would be proud of, of, of some of the self-revelation that goes on in works of art. And in fact, some artists use music and art as a form of therapy and, and use it to try and bring their inner demons to light to help themselves. And one of the first people to do this was one of the most successful songwriters of all time, uh, John Lennon, who was a member of the Beatles. He 
released an album, Imagine, where he, in 1971, that revealed a lot of his inner demons to people. And we thought, we, we had a, a think about this, about um, artists and musicians, and particularly John Lennon. Could we analyze the artistic output of these people to find out maybe what was going on behind the, the veneer that you, you would see in public? Now, I don't know if any of you have um, seen any interviews of songwriters, but often their most famous songs were written in just 15 minutes. They just gushed out uh, an emotional expression. Um, so we, we looked at the lyrics of John Lennon, and we wanted to analyze these. There's a lot of lyrics, obviously, and we wanted to try, try and analyze them in an objective way rather than going through and subjectively looking at them. And it just so happens that there is a way of doing that. And it's first of all, it's based on word spotting. Here's a couple of John Lennon's most famous songs, an early song, I Feel Fine. It's just a, a few phrases from the song. Now, that's a very positive song. And look at some of the words that appear in there. Good, happy, love, fine. And a much later song of his, Jealous Guy, which is a beautiful song, but I don't think anyone would necessarily call it a positive song in an explicit sense. If you look at the words there, lose, hurt, cry, jealous, insecure, shivering. There's a clear difference between these. But how can you quantify this? Well, thankfully, scientists have done a lot of the hard work in this job for us already. They've taken a list of almost 15,000 words, and they've asked people, large numbers of people, for each word they've said, give this word a score of positivity between 1 and 10. Now, this is an approximate thing, obviously, and everyone has their opinion. But when you do this with a large enough number of people, you start to see patterns and some words being much more positive than other words. And I think our intuition matches this. So we took this list of words, about 15,000 English words, we took 150 John Lennon songs, and for each year that John Lennon was actively releasing music, whether solo or with the Beatles, so that was from 1963 up to his tragic assassination in 1980. So in 1963, the first year, we, would, we looked at all of his lyrics. We looked at the positivity value of every word we could find in there that we had a positivity value for, and we averaged it. We did the same for 64, 65, and so on. And when we smoothed that to look at the general trends, we did see it a fascinating pattern that belied the PR that he would have had at the time. So what I've done here is the thick graph, the thick line is what the lyric positivity tells us, and the thin line in the background is kind of what people would have thought outside uh, you know, of John Lennon's inner circle. So you can see at the beginning, the Beatles took off, everyone was happy, great news. But then as the Beatles got more and more famous, more and more money, more and more prestige, vastly respected, John Lennon's lyric positivity plummeted in the mid-60s. He, he, he really, you know, if they were an expression of his happiness, he was not a happy man at the peak of the Beatles' climb to popularity. And in fact, we found out years later after he left the Beatles, he admitted that this was a traumatic time for him. He said that one of the principal reasons was a big divide between his public face and his private face. And it, it doesn't actually take a computer algorithm to look at a song like Help with an exclamation mark. You, you look at those lyrics, but the thing is it was set to a poppy tune, and they were all up there kind of doing their heads like this, you know, and it all looked happy, but it, it, he was not a happy guy. Another interesting thing, after John Lennon left the Beatles, or the Beatles split up, he talked about the freedom he felt. I feel so free, I'm no longer tied down. Um, the truth was, well, if we look at his lyrical positivity, it goes down again. And in fact, once again, we find out later that Lennon was having tremendous problems with heroin addiction. And the dream relationship he had with Yoko Ono, who many of you will have heard of, was in fact having terrible problems. Um, and they split up for a while in the 70s, in fact. So this is a little bit about this tells us maybe that lyric positivity can give us some insights into what's going on behind an artist's public, um, a public image. However, what's fascinating about John Lennon is that he did at least two-thirds of his most productive work with probably the most successful songwriter of all time, Paul McCartney. And in fact, some people say that Paul McCartney is a better songwriter than John Lennon and, and that we'll be whistling his tunes more in 50 years. But whatever your feelings about it, they had a profound influence on each other. So we wanted to see 
can we learn something about their relationship using this method? We took 150 of Paul's songs and we ran it through the algorithm. And what did we see? Well, first of all, what I have to do is I have to compress down the graph to make space for Macca because this is what Macca's positivity looks like. I mean, what a happy guy compared to Lennon in terms of his, uh, in terms of his lyrical positivity. In fact, the only time he comes close to um, the negativity of, uh, the relative negativity of Lennon's lyrics was during that time um, in the 60s when perhaps he was being pressured a lot to take LSD. He didn't want to take LSD. They were pressuring him to do it. It wasn't his kind of thing, truth be told. And they'd also stopped gigging towards this time. And McCartney was, was well into his gigging. He loved playing live. So that may explain to a degree why that negativity happens there. Another interesting difference in Lennon and McCartney, well, obviously, the, the, the split of the Beatles was a major turning point for them. And despite all of Lennon's protestations of freedom, and it's McCartney who seems to have been freed up by that change. His lyrical positivity has, has just gone up. And in fact, I'll tell you what this actually represents to me. McCartney was a, a, a more integrated character right from the beginning. Lennon had terrible demons. Anyone who knows Lennon's uh, biographical history, he had a very difficult childhood. He, was, he, was, he, he really had a very badly integrated personality. And, um, but McCartney was just a more normal guy. And it, it meant that he could plan and make wings, a proper band that took off in the 70s. Um, he settled down better with Linda. He didn't have all the chaos that, um, um, that John Lennon had with Yoko Ono. It was, it was, it was all... It was, well, there is one little thing, though. What happened in the late 70s to McCartney? If anyone can tell me, that'd be great, because we don't really know why there's that dip in the lyric positivity. Was it because the Wings albums weren't doing so great? Was it because of the stress that was going on in the band at the time? We're not sure, so if you've got any ideas, please do, do let me know. Now... I am a huge Beatles fan, I'm a huge Lennon fan, and I'm a huge McCartney fan. And when I saw this graph emerge, I felt immediately inspired. To me, this represents something very beautiful. Uh, these songwriters, when my father first played me that, that um, one of the most iconic pop albums of all time, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, when I was a young teenager, it blew me away, and ever since then, they, these people have blown me away. So to see this graph set me thinking, I want to express this, not just by publishing an academic paper. I want to express this in some other way. And luckily, I'm a composer. So what I did was I wrote a piece of classical music that involved a soprano and a tenor. The soprano represents um, John Lennon, and the tenor represents Paul McCartney. And I wrote this duet in a classical idiom, and afterwards, I, and I, it was about um, 30 seconds a year. So for every 30, se so the first 30 seconds was 1963 in music, and 1964. And then what I did is I, I took the graphs and I imposed them on the music. So for 1963, where you had very high lyrical positivity for McCartney, I would shove the tunes I'd written for 1963 for the tenor right to the top of the tenor's range. And for the years where Lennon had a low positivity, I'd shove his tunes, the soprano, down to the bottom of the range. This was a very painful process, actually, because it was sticking a, a, a machine in the middle of my composition process. But we were very happy with how it turned out. So I'm going to play you an excerpt in a minute. But I'd just like to finish with this before I do. Some of the great figures of the last 200 years have left tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of words available. And with modern computer scanning technology and the science of emotion analysis, we have an opportunity here to perform large-scale psychology and history on many of these people. And I think this is a tremendous opportunity that I hope we fully take advantage of. And uh, to finish off, I will play you a little bit.
personification of Lennon and McCartney. Thank you.